simpler case where um, we want to pipeline this function where um, <coughs> uh, these two computations depend on a value of r, which is computed from x. Okay. So, um, yeah. So that was this was a, a particular computation we want to pipeline. So as you can see, um, for a particular value of x, uh, you still need the previous value of r. And then you update R, right? Okay, so that's what is being done here. And a combinational implementation would essentially um, take the value of R from the latch, whatever has been latched by the previous computation. Okay, right? And a new value of R uh, will go into the latch at the same time as you take the current output. Right? And um, so the way to pipeline it was that we said, well, um, if we put a pipeline latch here, meaning that this is stage one, this is stage two, uh, this one doesn't work, right? Okay. Because um, um, this particular value essentially uh, is, is not really available on time. So that's a problem. Okay. Um, because as you can see here, the the forward path here goes to the latch. So particular value of A comes in, I compute this. So on that clock, it, it is staying, it is here, not yet there actually, okay. So the next value of X cannot take it from here, but should take it from here. It's already there, okay, right? So that's called a bypass. Um, so the bypass effect is the first case also, for example, this one. Which one? Uh, the, if there's going to be that condition based on R, so there also we can apply this. Which one? This one? No. Before that. The first example that you saw. The top one? No, before. Even before that? This one? This one? Huh? So up to this it is okay. Right? Talking about this one. Okay, so let's see what the class is. So he says that can we bypass R in this case? How many of you think it's we can? No? Why? <coughs> exactly. So it's not even computed here. There's no point in bypassing. Right? So bypassing comes into picture only if the value has been computed. Right? In this case, it's computed after this particular stage. So this has a So essentially, in this case, what is going to happen is that you need a value of R in a particular cycle when it is being computed. In the same cycle, it is being computed and you also need the value. That's important. Right, so if you, if you draw the pipeline diagram that we did last time, right? In this case, we have four stages. So time goes in this direction. So this is, let's say, x1. Okay, x1 is doing this, okay. For x2, so in this particular cycle, S4 is computing R for X1. And that R is needed exactly in the same cycle, which is not possible. Right? Okay. So these hazards are not easy to resolve. Where, um, as we said last time, I think we, we formalized this particular notion also. Um, uh, yeah, so um, source stage of data comes after the destination stage. Okay. That's a bit, that's 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 not easy to resolve. Okay. And the only way to resolve it, can somebody suggest? So going back to that example. <coughs> what can I do here to resolve this particular hazard? Sorry? More computation Well this is my this is my pipeline. I cannot change the pipeline. So R is computed in S4, but needed in S3. 
by the next proposition. <coughs> so any suggestions? How am I going to resolve this? What would you do? You can use what? Q. What kind of Q? So remember this thing that at time x, at time time t, r is being computed, and at the same time I need it. Okay. So what what Q are you going to use? Kind of buffer. Yeah. Buffer what? <coughs> uh, buffer. I mean, it's not there anymore. I mean, it's not there yet, right? It will be available in the future. What is the buffer going to do here? Can we uh, delay the operation? Which operation? Yes, of course. Yes, I can delay S3 here. Yes, I can, I can, I can delay it by a cycle. Then essentially what you're saying is for every computation of X, I'm going to lose one cycle. This is not a very good idea. So what do you normally do to look into the future? That's what we're trying to do here, right? What do you do? Schedule some other instruction. I have nothing else here. It just it's a very specialized computer which computes this particular function. Yes? What do you do to look in the future? Alert system. Sorry? Alert, some kind of alert. As soon as value will be computed, then we go. Well that's equivalent to what you say. Delay by yourself. So we will, but the, the earliest we can get is here. It's impossible to get here with the value that we need. Right? The value will be computed only at the end of this particular cycle. Remember that these are clock circuits. You cannot start something at an arbitrary point. <laughs> How do you do? Uh, how do you, how do you, how do you uh, say what will be tomorrow's symbol? You predict. You predict. Can I predict the value of R? Can I? Is that possible if the values that I'm computing are not completely random? Okay. If there is some pattern, if there is a high enough If, there's, if there is presence of pattern, I should be able to predict what the value of R is going to get, right? So I can predict the value of R here and use that. But I'll know whether I did it correct or not only one cycle later. Okay. So in case of a wrong prediction, I have to undo what I did and redo the value. Okay, right? So this thing is going to work only if your prediction accuracy is more than 50%. Which means, in more than half of the cases, you're going to win. Otherwise, you're essentially you'll, you'll be hardy with the problem. But often the case is that is, is the is the concept clear to everybody? This whole prediction thing. Okay. But often the case is that the misprediction fails, meaning that when you do the wrong, when you detect that you have done something wrong, undoing and redoing the right thing may be so expensive that you might require a much higher prediction accuracy to outweigh the, the loss. So for example, you may require 90% prediction accuracy to outweigh the loss of 10% misprediction. Okay. So we'll, we'll look at this particular problem in a different context, uh, but I just wanted to bring this up here. Um, is, the, is the concept clear to everybody? The, sorry? There will be some piece of hardware sitting here, which will be monitoring the pattern of the values of R. And we'll try to say, well, in the past 10 instances, I have seen a zero value from R. Maybe the next one is also zero. It's a very simple pattern. So it's a, it's, a pattern, it's a pattern minor that will be sitting here and giving me the next value of R, which will be verified here. Okay, okay. okay so going back. Yeah.
So we were looking at this particular computation. Um, we wanted a bypass path, right, to correct it. And we said that if a source stage of data comes before or equal to the destination stage, even if the data is written to a storage element at a later stage, we can resolve such a uh, hazard by a bypass. Right. So in this case, source stage is this one, right, where I produce R. And the destination stage is also this one. So I, with a bypass, I can resolve it. Okay, all right. And if I want to change the computation further, suppose I want x times r cube, okay, right? So I have to keep on bypassing until it, it ends up in a storage element. All right? So, um, so if you look at a particular stage s, let's say this one, right? So it is demarcated by two latches on two sides from the remaining pipeline. Okay. So the latch in front of it, that is this one, contains r produced by the current computation. Current value of x will produce an R, which will get latched here, right? Okay. And the latch after it contains R produced by the previous computation. This one contains the R that is computed by the previous one, and this is what I want. That's why I'm taking the bypass from this latch as opposed to this latch. Okay. Alright. Is it clear to everybody? This bypass concept. This one? This one currently contains um, so so I mean so this this one yeah. So this one will contain the, the final value of R. Okay, right? Uh, but um, but of course it will take several cycles to propagate through these latches and come here. <coughs> okay. Any questions about this? Is the bypassing clear from which latch is to bypass? Whether the front latch or the, or the, or the you know, back latch, which, which one it is? Okay, correct. So bypassing always works with, with uh, you know, when you when you take the value from the from the latch behind. Otherwise, it's not a bypass. You are just consuming the value that you have produced. Nothing else. So um, as I said last time, um, usually. The, the computer design cycle today uh, is about five to six years. That's the time it takes to design a microprocessor. Um, for example, the microprocessor that will be available for you in your laptops and desktops in 2016, the design started in 2010. Right? So it goes through several phases. And usually, the, the research starts with simulation. Because you cannot right away see them up, you know, the round table will decide to design and send it to front. That's not possible. That's costly because, and if that has bugs, you lose a lot of money. So you have to simulate your design to make sure that it's correct, that the, that the most important criterion, which gives you good performance, the second criterion. And it's robust. It doesn't fail. Um, uh, so, Simulation is very important. Okay. So, and, and when you simulate these computers, you have to simulate a pipeline. Okay. These machines are all today pipeline. So, uh, so let's. So, essentially, by simulating, I mean that you write a piece of software, which mimics the behavior of this particular hardware. So then, without building the hardware, you can feed the software with your input x, and you produce output f x, and you can measure the performance, how many cycles it took to produce f x, how much energy it consumed to produce f x, and so on. So, um, so let's take a look at this simple example, the one that we started with yesterday, the cubing circuit, right? computes fx equal to x cubed. Um, so it's a two-stage pipe. Let's call them m1 and m2. I have a latch in between. Um, <clears throat> so you can see that um, I can easily write down a piece of software describing this particular block. It's a multiplier. Whatever algorithm I want to implement in the multiplier, I can easily write it down. Okay, the question arises about this particular latch here, this latch here, and this latch here. 
how to how to manage their behavior. You might wonder what's the big deal? It should be easy, right? So let's think about it. The first question that arises is in a sequential simulator, in which order would you simulate these two? These two five stages to capture the correct behavior in the inside. So forty-two. Now two stages A1 and A2. Should I simulate A1 first and then A2 in a cycle? Because remember that in a particular cycle, both the stages must be working. It's a pipeline, right? Okay. A1 will be working on a certain input X, M2 should be working on the previous input X in the same cycle. Okay, all right. So I'm simulating a particular cycle, I have to decide in which order I should simulate them. What do you think? Of course, I have two possibilities, right? First M1, then M2, first M2, then M2. Which one is correct? M1 and M2. M1 and M2? Because the first cycle, we don't have any M2 for M2. Okay, all right. So in a sequential simulator, remember that your simulator is a sequential piece of software. You first simulate M1, right? And you match the value produced by M1 here. And then you invoke M2. M2 will see the value, right? And immediately compute M2. But that's not the correct behavior. M2 should be computing that in the next cycle. Do you see the problem? Yeah. So it has to be the other way then, right? I don't have any other option. Computes what it needs to compute, yes, but doesn't update the latch. When does it update the latch? At the, uh, when all the computation, all the stages are done. All the stages are, are done. Then you should update uh, the latches. Um, okay. So, um, <coughs> what if I compute M two first and then M one? So what? So he has suggested one solution that don't update the latch. So which essentially means I will have some internal storage, right? To store the values computed by M1. Okay. I want to avoid that. Suppose I do M2 first and then M1. Will that simulate the correct behavior? It does, right? First cycle, M2 goes, there is nothing to do. It stays, stays idle, M1 will compute something. Next cycle, M2 will pick up what M1 has computed, and M1 will pick up the new input. Right? Is that okay? So thumb rule one, keep this in mind. In a, in a pipeline simulation, you should always go from back to front, simulating the five stages. Okay, all right? And this is the reason why you have to do that. Okay. <clears throat> is it clear to everybody why you cannot do A1 before and A2 then? Yeah, so, so it's a sequential piece of software. Okay, right? So if you, if you first do M1, M1 will update the latches. And then when you invoke M2, M2 will immediately see the updated latches, right? And will compute on that. So essentially, in effect, what you have done is that in, a, in the same cycle, you have invoked M1 and M2 on the same input. Maybe I'll show you here. So suppose um, you have some, you'll have some main tool, right? While one, take input X. Invoke M1X, so that will put into into a latch L1, let's say, and uh, Fx equal to M2L1, right? Right? That's my simulation. Okay. So I take x. <coughs> so essentially, okay. Cycle plus plus. <coughs> this is one cycle of my simulation. Okay. <coughs> So I take a, new, take, a, take a new input x, I compute, put it in L1, M2 picks that up, computes fx, my computation finishes in a cycle. So I take an input x, produce y in one cycle, that's wrong, right? It should, should have taken two cycles to produce y. Okay, but if I switch the orders, see what happens.
Per cycle M2 gets invoked, does nothing. There is nothing in the, in the latch, okay? M1 takes up X, puts it in L1. Cycle increments by one. Next cycle, M2 picks up whatever is, has been put by M1, computes FX. Okay. Right? At the end of two cycles, you see the first output coming out. And then every cycle, there will be one output coming out from this. All right? Okay. Yes, it will. Yes. You will get some garbage value. Yes. Exactly. Which is why this, this particular sampling latch is important. Okay. So the first, first time you, 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 you uh, the first clock, when, the, when it strikes, you will probably get, a, get something garbage. Yes. Yeah. Clear to everybody? Back to front order of simulation in the pipeline? Yes? Well, then you take an input x. You mean, what if I do m1, m1 and then m2? Yeah. yeah, so in that case, you'll be picking up x and producing fx in one cycle. That's the problem. Because this l1 here is just a variable, nothing else, right? Okay. So if you switch the order, right, it doesn't, it doesn't work, right? So if you put fx here equal to uh, m2 l1, you update l1, this function takes up l1, produces fx in the same cycle. That's not correct. That's a wrong behavior, right? My pipeline is supposed to produce one output two cycles later. Two cycles after it takes a bill. Right? Okay. So this one actually mimics your combinational circuit. But the end will be able to center up two cycles. So we will ignore first cycle output. Oh no, no, you will miss the first output. You will miss the first output actually. It's going to get overwritten actually. <clears throat> okay, all right. So I mentioned a sequential simulator uh, just to you know, make you comfortable about thinking. When you go to a parallel simulator, the problem doesn't change. In a parallel simulator, what I, what I might be doing is that I'll have a thread for simulating M1, another thread for simulating M2. And I'm actually pushing that problem to the scheduler now. The scheduler has to decide which one to invoke first. Did I simulate, did I schedule A1 before M2? Or M2 before M1 in a cycle? Same problem, exactly same problem, okay? Okay, um, so that was about our cubing circuit. So now, uh, let's take up a more general problem. That is how to simulate a general pipeline computation. So I have two stages here again, A and B, okay? And suppose the latency of B depends on the value of AX. So whatever value that gets latched here will determine how long it's going to take for B to compute the value. All right? And the maximum latency of B is much higher than the fixed latency of A. So which means the computation of B is highly non-deterministic. Okay. Sometimes it takes a very small amount of time, sometimes it takes a very large amount of time. And that depends on the value of X. Okay, all right? And the maximum latency of B is much higher than A. Okay, so that means if you plug the pipe at 1 over max a comma b, that offers the worst case performance all the time. That's correct. There's no problem with that. Okay. So that's what we learned, right? That if you have two stages, you should take the max. Should take the max. But in this case, it's going to give you very poor performance. And actually, in most of the cases, we might be able to do better than this. Because we are essentially designing the circuit for the worst case here. Okay. So naturally, the question arises, what if I clock it at 1 over a? So by the way, small a and small b are latencies of a and b. What if I clock it at, clock it at 1 over a? So of course, in, in some of the cases, what may happen is that b might be doing something i as well over right. Okay. Right? Okay. So what is the solution? So here it says that replace the latches by queues. Okay. So I put a queue here now. Also, I replace these by a queue, these by a queue. And I clock it, at, clock it at 1 over A. So what is now going to happen? In some cases, the queue is going to drain, maybe at a faster rate than this gets filled up, or maybe at the same rate. And in some cases, it's going to get drained at a slower pace. So this queue will grow, shrink, 
depending on how fast do you complete it, okay. right? But of course, whenever, you know, there will be some cases where the queue is not full, because B is now running slow. So A cannot inject any more input. Okay, so that will automatically push, put pressure on this queue. Okay, and eventually the environment will back up. But eventually B will finish computing, the queue will start draining, pipeline will start moving. Okay. So these are very typical scenarios in a processor, where you find that different pipe stages have different latencies, and of course you will not try to clock it at one over max of the all the pipe stages. Because that would be the worst case. You still be very optimistic and clocking at a faster rate, but put queues in between to, to you know take care of this particular slack difference. Okay. Is it clear to everybody? Why I want to replace latches by queues? Okay. Use a queues of latches. Queue of latches by queues. Yes. So so you can think of it as queues of max. Empty, why should it be empty? B should be computing something, which is why the queue is full. But subsequent, after that? After that, yeah, maybe empty. Yeah, that's possible. Yes, very much possible. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that given that um, max of A comma B will be a rare case, hopefully. Okay. In most cases, you'll be fine. You'll be, you'll be delivering performance much better than this one. Okay. So now the question, let's now again go back to the same question. How do you simulate this for the pipeline? Are there any new problems or am I actually done? Should I just go and simulate B first and then A? So again, the, the, the question is same, right? I can write down a piece of software that tells me what A does. And I can write down a piece of software which tells me what B does. The question is about the interface. How do you simulate the interface? It's simulated problem. That's right, yes. So the, the fundamental question I'm interested in is in which order should I simulate this? A before B or B before A? I have a queue in between. And as you, can, as you know, the queue offers four functions, in queue, DQ, full, and A before B. A before B? B is B and A. First B is then A. First B then A. I tell you that both have problems. So let's take one by one. Okay. <coughs> So let's suppose that I simulate A before B. Okay, all right. So I, since I have already told you that there is a problem, you can even think of a situation where I might not be able to mimic the behavior of the pipeline if I do that. If A, small A, small B are equal, then the same problem as this pipeline was No, 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 no. I, I'm not asking about a specific scenario. I'm saying this has in general a problem. So, so that, that problem remains, right? Okay. That I I enqueue something and B picks up that queued token immediately. Okay, in the same side. That's wrong. So that's no luck. What's the problem with B before it? Does somebody see a problem? No, I, I don't understand. See, the point is that the simulation of B will still be a multi-cycle simulation. So I'll still be mimicking that behavior, which means the Q may actually grow up gradually, gradually, and may fill up while B is working. I'll have to simulate that again, of course. Yeah, but you don't know uh, what is the number of cycles taken by B. I know that, yeah. These are parameters to my simulator. I know small a and small b. Only. Yes, I'll, I'll do that, yeah. But remember that the latency depends on the value of x. So when, I, when input comes in, I will, then I know the latency of this computer. Not before that. Okay. Yeah, so when I get an x, I'll, I'll invoke b for those many cycles. Those many cycles I'll charge. Within those cycles, the queue may grow up. 
So significant unit and it may have become full actually. So I'll try to be able to simulate that. But anyway, I don't know if these details are important here. What I'm asking is scheduling B before A has a problem. So if Q is empty, then B will keep on computing. Blank means it go on blank computing. B. If Q is empty. That means I have no input coming in? Yes. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So and if it's overflow then what is overflow? Q. Which Q? This Q. When this queue fills up, A will stop accepting inputs. Yeah. So now, of course, when you invoke A, there is a condition that this queue has at least one slot. Then only the A can compute. So that's all. <coughs> so scheduling B before A, why is that problem? might be busy, but yeah, but A is free to go, right? So no problem. So I'll structure my simulator to this, do that. Don't worry about that. How I exactly structure it. But I'm saying what at you know on, on every cycle I have to make this decision. Should I schedule B or A? So what happens, so when does B get invoked, first of all? When does B does something? When there is something in that queue, right? Otherwise, B has nothing to do, actually. It just goes to sleep, right? Okay. So there is something here. This is not empty. And this is not full, right? That's also an option. That al that's also a condition you can check. Interfaces with this side of the environment. Can overflow and maintain no reception output? Why is it not? Might the environment is wrong. No, no, the clock frequency is same, right? So the same clock hitting all the three latches. <coughs> So suppose, imagine a situation that <coughs> this queue is full. All right? In a particular cycle, this, this queue is full. Okay, so what, what, how should the pipeline behave? A should not do anything in that cycle, right? B should pick up an item, process it, and put it in the queue. So assume that this queue has at least one slot. Right? That should be the correct behavior. So let's see now what, does, what our software simulator does. It invokes B, picks up this item, puts it here. Now invokes A, A, C, A says, oh, there is one slot here. Right? It picks up an X, passes that. That's wrong. That's the wrong behavior. Is it clear to everybody? OK? Wait, A should not have been invoked in this cycle. The change of this queue state should not be visible in the cycle to A. But it became visible. How do you fix it? In whatever input B does, it becomes effective after A is completed. After A is completed, exactly. So, so in such a simulator, this is again very, very typical in a process simulator. Every cycle's operation will have to be separated into two parts. Okay. The state updates will happen at the end of the cycle. Right? So what you should do is, while one, so you take the, uh, sorry, let, let me see, I'll just hook up a new function which says queue.head, okay, right? So it should return me the head of the queue, but not dequeued actually, okay, all right? So B will operate on that, and uh, A will operate on, so let's call it Q. L1, uh, <coughs> operate
for it on environment spread. All right. And then you can do the DQ, Q dot QL1 dot DQ. L1 dot NQ and all the other things and then cycle clusters. Okay. Right. So you separate the, the computation of one cycle into two parts. One is computation, other one is data okay. Then even though we got the head of the queue, A will still think that the queue is full. It will actually not wake up in that cycle. Yeah, do nothing. 